Hello from wherever you are, and welcome to Let's Play Games. I'm John McFarland, Adult Services Librarian for Nashville Public Libraries, and I hope you'll join me in learning or rediscovering some of the more common and uncommon games out there. This time, we're going to go all the way back to one of the original games created far back. And I'm going to show you how, with just dice and 24 triangles, you can make an entire game of strategy that you get to play over and over again. Let's get stuck in. So, we have this board. Let me describe it in as simple a way as possible. You have 24 spots right here, 24 triangles. And this is pretty standard look for how a board will be. Each of these spots is corresponding with a number from one all the way to 24. So that way you can keep track of where certain things are. You also have 15 pieces. They will go on the board as here. And the way that they move will be through dice rolls. So by rolling a five and a two, you have a couple options here. You can either move your piece five, move it two, or move it seven. In a vacuum, that is how you make your movements. But of course, it's never just that simple. So what you have, everyone has two dice. There's usually two cups, and this is the development of early anti-cheating by making sure that you had to roll the dice inside the container and spill it out that way, rather than being able to roll it with your hand where you could, in theory, replace it with another die. Do something to it to affect its roll. So this is a very early and rudimentary anti-cheating device. So you have 15 pieces for the black and 15 pieces for the other color. And it's important about placing it on a particular side of the board. And the object of this game is taking your pieces and getting into your home space. Well, how do we do that with the 15 pieces? First, here's one of the big things that I had to learn when I was first playing this game. The way the movement goes is you want to move towards yourself. The opposing player wants to move towards their selves. That's why this is usually called the home area. And the board is set up in a pretty unique way. There are two pieces that will be on the opposite corner. So what your 24 is. The other player will put it at one. So it's supposed to mirror the other. Here's the next layer of complexity. These five pieces are going to be right here in your home area. So these last six squares and triangles are your own space, your home area. And that's gonna become very important here soon. So you then have five more pieces that will be on their home end. You'll take another five pieces and place it on the opposite side. So your 13 will be on the opposite corner. So it should look a little like this. And on the opposition side, it will look as such. So notice how it's gonna have a mirror look. Now, what do we do with these last three pieces? You'll actually place it right on this second triangle. When I was first learning, I always kept putting it at the third triangle, but it's really the second, I promise you. And it's going to be perfectly mirrored over here. So you have five pieces on the sixth triangle, three pieces on the eighth triangle, five pieces on the 13th triangle, and two pieces all the way on the other side of the board at 24. The other person will have it mirrored. And what you do is through the dice rolls, so I'll roll once again, is that you now have the ability to get started and move your pieces from one side of the board to the other. 
in just a couple of dice rolls. But more on how you move and the complexities of how you get blocked in one moment. So to go into the history of this game is to go all the way back to antiquity. The first iteration we have of any sort of peace-moving style game is the royal game of Ur, around 2600 BCE. And it involved moving around the board with pieces in opposite directions while capturing pieces when you can. Now, this first iteration of what we now know as backgammon was known as taula, or table. And it was seen in numerous areas of Roman development, Greek development, and most of the Middle East in a format similar to the game that we know today. But more on all of how it developed in a moment. So from here, we're going to start moving the pieces on the board in accordance with what we rolled on dice. So we rolled a three and we rolled a two. Now you have a couple of options. You can move maximum number of pieces two, and you can move one of them two, one of them three, or you can use both dice rolls to move them five. But there's a little bit of a trap. Each piece has a certain stacking quality to it. So if it has more than one item on its triangle, you cannot capture the piece because all pieces, if they are left on their own, have the potential of being captured. However, if you have a second tile on it, you cannot do it, it is completely blocked. This is where a lot of the strategy of the game comes in. So you have to make a decision as a player, making sure that you can do a legal move. For example, if I had rolled a one, I could not move it here like this. Or let's say I only had these two pieces and I roll, what's this, a five and a two? You can't do five and then two because they're not legal moves to make. You could, however, do two on this piece, but you couldn't do the extra five. You would be blocked from moving. If we're towards the end of the game and your pieces are blocked, you lose that turn. You're unable to move if you don't have a legal move to do. So part of what the strategy of this game is, is getting the pieces from all the way on the opposite side of the board into these last six triangles. You cannot take pieces off the board and into this home area until you have all of your pieces on your home side in the last six. This becomes mightily important if your piece is trapped all the way over on the opposite side you cannot start putting these pieces off until you have everything on your side. So it becomes a little bit of a race and a little bit of a competition. So there's a little bit more detail into how we're going to play this game. Now I'm going to go through just a rudimentary run through basic a couple pieces here. So I've got this two and this three and I can move, for example, this one two and this one three, but both of these become exposed. And if they're captured are placed here in the center of the board. And this is potentially a big negative because you must move this piece first. And if you can't move the piece, you're blocked from moving the entire way. So this is that next upper level strategy to try and keep pieces from their home board while getting your pieces home. So I'm going to, for the sake of this, uh, do one, two, one, two, three. I have not risked these pieces because there's still four, so more than one, and I've increased that there are now four pieces here. And I'll just place mine back in the cup or roll for red. Now red gets to make their move. They have the ability to move either one piece six and one piece three or one piece nine. So it's this simple mental math of where you're going to, going to move on the board. Now here, I have the ability to potentially bring a piece over here 
four, six. But if black then rolls a six, that piece can be captured. So maybe not the necessarily best move. I could move here, another six, and then one, two, three. But this moves to risk if I then roll a one, two, three. So everything is about making that calculated decision into how you want to play. Some people like trying to develop the board on their home side and trying to make the path blocked for the pieces that are remaining over here. Other people like trying to complete the game as fast as possible and not paying attention to where the other pieces are. You can play in your own way. That's the best part. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do, let's see here. I kind of wish I had rolled a five here because that would have made it a little easier for that three and five movement. But I will move six and then I will move three. So you can find online numerous opinions onto the strategy of how you want to play opening pieces, but you can make individualized decisions based on your comfort level. Now here's where we run into the first instance of a captured piece. I have six pieces away, one unprotected. So what you'll do is you'll capture that piece, place the red one on the board. That is my movement of six. I still have a five left. And what I can do is I can then make a movement here and it's still protected as it has more than one and this now has five. So we're a little closer to home. So for the red player, they rolled a six and a three. So this is going to count as one. So you can only do one, two, three because one, two, three, four, five, six is right here. It's an ineligible move. So here's where you run to being trapped because if you have an entire section of pieces that are here to here, let's say there were two pieces on each of these, I would have to roll pretty high in order to be able to surpass it. One, two, three, four, five, six. So from this vantage point, I'd have to roll a six just to get that piece out because if it's blocked, it's blocked. There's nothing much you can do about it until the other person moves. So let's take a step back. I wanna tell you a little bit more about the history of this game and then we'll continue on. So as promised, a little bit more about the history of the game. One of the best documentations we have from an early time period is actually from the third century in the Byzantine Empire. The then emperor named Zeno was playing Taula in its form that it was previously at. And it actually documented for the first time the outcome of an entire game being played through. One of the biggest things that we saw from this game was that he had a very unlucky dice roll and was forced into the unlucky and mostly unwinnable situation of having to break apart all of his protected pieces. And it had commentary similar to how we have sports commentary in the modern age, but it's one of the earliest examples we have and probably one of my favorites. What I wanna talk about is a little bit higher level of strategy. Let's increase the difficulty as we go along. Now, we had that six and three roll from earlier. Three was the only piece we could do. So we still have our six remaining. Now, what I'm gonna do here is capture this piece right here. And there's a particular reason for strategy why this is important. So notice you start on the opposite side of the board, which means that you need 24, technically 25, to get all the way to the other side of this board and completely borne off is the term that we use. So notice I'm on square, let me move it back here a second. I'm on what we call triangle seven. Well, that means I just lost 18 squares of progress in order to move. And 
from here, let's say I get captured, I'm only missing out on seven. So part of the math is, imagine a little counter here, that I need a total of X number to get all of my pieces completely born off. Well, if I have this piece captured so close, I've now added 15 to that total amount. Whereas if this piece then gets captured, I may have gained, let's say this captures here, gained six back, I will have also cost them only seven. So part of this game is that level of trade-off. So let's go ahead and do that because really that's our best option. Now they're gonna have to get three pieces all the way over rather than just two. So we'll go back to black and as long as we don't roll double sixes, we're fine. The reason why is if we rolled double sixes, we couldn't play it and we would lose the entirety of the progress. Here's one of the cool things, which I'm sure I will roll anytime now. If you roll doubles, you get double your movement. So if you get two sixes, you'll have four sixes. Two twos, four twos. As long as you have a valid movement to do, you can use it up to that number of times in order to make a legal move. So I'm sure we'll see it at some point, but now we've got black here that their only option is to use that too, but it means progress. Now here we are once again with the decision of, do I wanna capture this piece and put it at risk? Because if I roll another four, well, now this piece is in trouble. But we're gonna go ahead and do that for now. But we have the problem where this piece is now on its own. It's now exposed. So we run the risk of making some progress while losing a lot. So we'll go ahead and roll for red again. And I got away a little lucky this time. So now I can choose, let's make sure you see this, a one and a five. So you can either move it here or move it here, but you must move this piece first. Let's move this here, and who knows, we'll move this one five. We'll kind of got a similar strategy here going on. What I'm aiming to do is not only keep pieces around, but I want to make sure, and there's a six, so I can make that move. Now this piece is protected. I'm wanting to build a little bit of a safety wall. This is one, two, three, four, five. I could move it there, or I could move this one, one, two, three, four, five, and capture this, but at the risk of any roll of two or three is gonna capture that piece. I don't like playing that aggressively, so what I'll do is I'll move this one here. So that way, if a piece is captured either through a roll of six, one, or three, I only lose seven triangles of progress rather than the full amount that I'd be risking of 22 rolls of progress. So now we're gonna go back to, and I technically got away lucky a little bit, but from here, I've got another decision to make on capturing. So I can't you move this one more than just one. And I can't move this one more than just the one because any roll, at least here, of three, four, and five is blocked until I have the ability to jump over it or I have the ability to capture a piece through pieces being forced to be moved. What I'm gonna do though is I am going to move this one and go ahead and capture a piece again and use both of the total for a total of six. So. From here, you're starting to develop a little bit more of the game strategy. So a little bit more about the history of it, I wanna share with you because there's a fascinating history behind this. So as any game from antiquity, there ends up being variants and more modern versions of the game. In around the 10th century, 11th century AD, we started seeing different types of this game develop. 
So we had one version that didn't use any sort of doubling cube, which I'll talk more about in a little bit. There had to be all of your pieces borne off and you could only get pieces on the board by rolling doubles, making for a significantly longer game. You had another version where a single piece could block a point rather than multiple. You had yet another version where you were all going the same direction rather than in opposite directions. So the game continued to develop in its own way, but the general rules stayed the same. So one last thing before we go, how a game ends. You can do all of the developing and capturing that you need, but there's a point where everybody has passed everybody and it becomes a race. So here's one thing I want you to have as a frame of reference. I mentioned before about the total number of dice and pips on the dice that you need to roll in order to completely bear all of your pieces off the board. So for here, any dice roll of one will allow me to do so. Any roll higher than one, if I can't use any further back, I can use that. So if you roll a six here, you have to use a, an available six, which you'd want to do anyways. But as we get towards the end, and there's no pieces left on the six side, any roll of five or six will allow you to bear off. So keep in mind that number of what you need to roll. I would say right now that the red side is in a little bit more of advantage because they only need to roll a total of 18 to get all of these off, six, 12, 18. Whereas on the black, we need six, 12, 18, 24, 30, 36, 42 in order to get the same number. Now we have a little bit more here, but if we count all of this up, you'll find that red needs to technically roll fewer in order to win the game. So what we'll start doing now, usually you'd have a little bit more hope, and if it falls on the side like that, just re-roll it. And I rolled double fours here, which means I can take all three of these fours off the board. And I have to use something that is more than four away. So I can't bear any of these three off. And typically you wouldn't want to anyway. So you want to get things as close as possible. So I'll take this six and move it four. Now I only need two. So in one dice roll, I've eliminated 16 based on the quadruple fours that I needed. So it's just some simple math where you go towards the end of the game and try and get as many pieces off the board as fast as possible. And the first person to do so completely is the winner of that round. That's all the time we have for today. Thanks for tuning in. Next time, we're gonna go a little bit further into how to play this game and play a bit more strategically. Building walls, taking pieces, I'll get into all of that and more. I'll see you next time.